Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have a great presentation. We are going to be talking about government benefits one on one. But before I introduce, make the introduction to our great presenter, I will talk uh, to you guys about Partner Research Network. My name is Veronica Alvarez, and I'm the Regional 13 Coordinator for Partner Research Network. Partner Resource Network is the parent training and information centers for Texas. We are funded by the Department of Education, specifically the Office of Special Education to provide free resources and trainings for parents of children with disabilities and youth with disabilities. Our mission is to empower and support Texas families and individuals impacted by disabilities or special healthcare needs. We serve parents of children with disabilities and youth with disabilities from the ages of zero to 26 years old. We serve in all the state of Texas. And now we have Partner Research Network has four projects serving parents in all the state. Myself, I'm part of the team project. In the map, you can see the red color. So I'm in Austin, I, I serve parents in Austin, and then we have uh, Region 20 and Region 1. That's the three uh, regions that forms the team project. But if you are here for another area and you don't know your regional coordinator, please just reach out, send a text, an email, or uh, put it in the chat box and we can, um, provide you that information of which is your regional coordinator that lives very uh, near to you. Our services are free and we provide parent workshops, youth workshops, webinar, information and referrals, one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. We do a lot of support in the R meetings and IEP meetings. Um, we do once a year a symposium. We offer parent leadership trainings, youth leadership trainings, and help you access to social media resources. So for today webinars, this is the housekeeping items. Uh, if you have a question, please type it in the chat box or in the Q&A, and we will try to answer all your questions during the presentation. Um, your uh, microphone and your uh, video camera is off. Please use the chat box so that you Q&A. And uh, this webinar is being recorded and uh, we will share this, um, this uh, webinar in our Facebook page, in the, in the Partners Research Network Facebook page. And also in a little bit, uh, Allison is going to talk about uh, consolidated planning group. Also, they have a YouTube channel and they have all these recordings in their site. Um, at the end of this presentation, you are going to receive a link for a survey. That's an evaluation. We really appreciate uh, for you if you do this for us. Uh, it's just three, uh, you need to answer three questions uh, and that we help us a lot to improve our presentations and to report to our grant. Um, we do not provide CEUs, but if you need a certificate of attendance, I can do one for you. Just tap it in the chat box and I can help you with that. So again, this is my contact information, my name, Veronica Alvarez, my phone number, my email. Um, I already also put it in the, in, the, in the chat box. And please visit our main webpage at www.prntexas.org. This is more information about our project. This is our project director, Lisa Coward. That's her uh, contact information and the other regional coordinators in the team project. So that's it for me. So now I'm going to start my sharing. Um, we have Alison Chaberg from Consolidated Planning Group. She is our speaker today. And uh, she is a very experienced financial advisor for the special needs community. She had more than 25 years of experience working with families with special needs. And also she's a parent or two um, uh, young adults with disabilities. So she has a lot of experience working with families like ours. Thank you so much, Alison, to being with us today again. 
Thank you, Veronica. It's always a pleasure to be back with you. And it's always nice to hear about Team Project and Partners Resource Network. There truly are a lot of resources out there that are available to families uh, for free. Lots of help out there. So I love what you guys are doing. It's always my pleasure to be here. So um, Allison Scobberg here, Consolidated Planning Group for anybody. We are domiciled in Texas. We actually serve people all across the U.S., not just in Texas. So if we've got any people that are attending today that don't live in Texas, that's okay. You are welcome here. We're glad you're here. And the topics that we're talking about today, Government Benefits uh, 101 will be applicable in, uh, in your state as well. Um, there are some caveats for some states in the SSI amounts, um, like, for instance, California and things like that. Um, so Consolidated Planning Group is a holistic special needs financial planning firm. We are an advisory consulting firm. We're nationally certified as social security advisors, members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. Um, we help families just like yours who are trying to navigate the future um, for both your, your yourselves as well as your loved one with a disability. Um, we answer questions like, who's going to um, care for my child when I'm gone? How much money do I need to fund a special needs trust? How and when should I apply for government benefits like SSI and Medicaid? What if I get that denial letter from Medicaid? Um, you know, we help with a lot of those things. We help people um, open ABLE accounts. We do a lot of advocacy, as um, Veronica mentioned. Uh, we do a lot of webinars every single week, and those were really born out of my own frustration um, on how difficult and how hard everything is um, that, that we do for our kids, whether it's getting on the waiver list, figuring out where you are in the list, um, understanding, you know, the various benefits that we should apply for and when we should apply for those. So um, Consolidated Planning Group has a YouTube channel. It's just the Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel, and there'll be a link for that in today's slides as well. Um, there are over 300 webinars out there on topics surrounding planning for special needs, like guardianship special needs trust, of course, SSI and Medicaid, Medicaid waivers. Um, we've tried to title them intelligently so you can search for kind of the stuff that you are, um, that you're on in your journey. So that way you can find the material that is relevant to you. We partner with other organizations and attorneys and provide valuable content to you that way. When it comes to special needs planning, um, fewer than one-tenth of a percent of all financial advisors um, are nuanced or have any background in special needs. And our situation as a parent with a loved one with a disability is specialized. It's important to work with a specialist. And the reason that is important, because it is critically important that we have money in the right buckets um, to preserve eligibility for state and federally funded programs. Um, a, a, uh, there's a lot of accidents that happen. We accidentally left uh, money to a child as a beneficiary. We accidentally had money in a child's name. And all of those um, things can actually cause them not to be eligible for government benefits like SSI um, or Medicaid. So one of the big things that comes up, um, and I spent a little time on this one, um, today's um, Excuse me. Today's um, material, there's a lot of material today, and we're going to do our very best to get through all of it. But it's really understanding the difference between SSDI and SSI, because a lot of times people will say, my child's getting Social Security, and they're truly not. They're actually getting SSI. And um, now there are some instances where a, your loved one with a disability is getting SSDI, or maybe they're getting a combination of SSI and SSDI. And about two cases a year, I'll see a person that comes in and they're actually getting SSI, SSDI, and childhood disability benefits under a parent's record. So we're going to talk about some of those differences. So Social Security Disability, um, this is call, also called SSDI, also called Social Security. The source of the payment is through the Disability Trust Fund. It's an insurance that workers earn by paying Social Security taxes on their wages. It pays benefits to the disabled and individuals who are unable to work regardless of their household income and resources. Benefits are for workers and for adults disabled since childhood, but they must meet insured 
requirements. So this is the first conundrum. It's confusing because we think my loved one is disabled. They should qualify for Social Security disability. It only makes sense. The words make sense, right? But usually these kids don't qualify for SSDI because maybe they've never worked or they haven't worked long enough to pay into the system to be fully insured. But the other program is called Supplemental Security Income, also known as SSI. Payments come from the general tax revenues, not the SSA trust funds. It's a needs-based public assistance program that does not require a person to have a, a work history. It pays disabled individuals who are unable to work and have limited income resources. Benefits for children and adults in financial needs must have limited income um, and limited resources. So one thing I want to just mention, and I'm going to, I'll mention this again, but a lot of our loved ones are disabled and they've been disabled for a very long time, maybe even since birth, birth. And maybe we applied for SSI and we got denied and you don't understand it. Clearly the loved one has a disability. How could they possibly say they don't qualify for this? Well, first things first, the first thing you need to know as a parent, as many people don't qualify for SSI and Medicaid when their child is under age 18. And the reason for this is this is a means-based program um, for the indigent and the disabled. When the child is under age 18, the qualifications, the income, and the resource qualifications are based off of the parent's income and assets, not the child. So if you have applied for your child before and they were a minor and they were denied because you made too much income or you had too much resources, it does not mean that the child will not qualify later when they turn 18. Because once they turn 18, even if the child is under full guardianship, lives in your household, once they turn 18, it's based off of their income and assets. So I just, I always like to bring that up because sometimes people feel defeated. They, they apply, they went through the process, it was a pain, then they got denied, and they don't know that they should go back to the well after the child turns 18. So I just want to encourage families on that. Okay, so disability rules over age 18 for SSDI and SSI, a physical or mental impairment, the disability is expected to last 12 consecutive months or, not and, or result in death. Um, they're going to they're gonna look at age, education, past work activity, and the inability to perform substantial work activity. Okay, that's what they're going to be looking at. So, when we talk about the substantial um, work activity, we're, it's something else you may have heard of. And I want to just mention that the Social Security Administration loves acronyms. Um, and those acronyms can be very confusing. Some things um, look synonymous and they're not. And some things don't look synonymous and they actually are. Um, so we're going to talk about some of these um, acronyms today. So substantial gainful activity for 2023, um, the number is 1470 gross earnings per month. Okay, so basically when you're applying for SSI, it's okay if the individual is working at the time of the application, as long as they are not working, earning more than the substantial gainful amount, which is 1470 gross per month. Um, if the individual is blind, that substantial amount is um, 2460 per month. They have recently announced the numbers for 2024. So the substantial gainful activity is 1550 per month for 2024. And it went up to 2590 if, you are, um, if your loved one is blind. Um, SSI, the Supplemental Security Income, only uses SGA as a measure of work during the initial claims. But SSDI uses SGA throughout the life of the claim. So if, once you're approved for SSDI, they're going to be checking this, these income, the substantial gainful activity through the life of the claim. Okay, so let's talk about the SSI benefit rates. They've gone up significantly over the years. Um, I, I, it seems like it was just a few years ago that it was 741 a month. So they have been going up. They went up significantly last year and, and again this year. So right now, your SSI benefits monthly are 914 per month. Um, effective January of 2024, they are going up to 943. Um, that number is 
1371 for 2023 if both if if you're a, if it's a couple and they are both disabled and 1415 per month um, if both parties are disabled in 2024. Okay, so one thing I like to mention here, because a lot of times when we have um, as many people on as we do today, people say, wait, hold the phone. We're not getting $914 a month. What's, what's the problem? Um, if you're not getting $914, um, your benefit, um, first of all, it could be reduced for work. And if you are getting, let me just do the math here. So... So 914 minus 313, you could be getting like um, basically 601 or 600 and something a month. If you're getting that, what that tells me is that you need to submit a rent agreement, um, a rent or a fair share agreement. And I, there's been some rumblings that that is actually going away in 2024, and I need to verify that. But um, basically, when you're getting an SSI payment, that SSI payment is for food and shelter. Okay, it's designed to pay for food and shelter. So if you do not have a rent agreement in place for your loved one, um, then they're going to they're going to have a one third reduction to their SSI. This can be fixed by submitting a rent agreement and simply each month when the SSI check comes in, then you move. I, I often use the number of five hundred a month. Um, Rent, you move the 500 a month um, rent over to you if they're living in your household or wherever they're, they're, they're basically living to show that the individual is paying rent. Another reason that you could be getting less than the 914 a month is if your loved one is actually working. Um, because if they are working, the, then there are deductions, and we're going to talk about those in a few minutes. There are deductions for working, and I'm going to um, I'm going to teach you how to calculate that and how to plan that. I'm just going to take a pause for a moment, Veronica. Do we have a couple of questions? They were asking about our contact information, and we are going to share the the slides. I already copy paste your information again in the chat box and the Q and A. Okay, perfect. Um, thanks. Um, all right, so the means-based test. We were talking about SSI as a means-based program. It is for the indigent um, and the disabled. So basically the means-based test of what they're looking for is $2,000, less than $2,000 in the person's name. Um, married couples can have 3,000, a child and one parent, uh, 4,000, a child and two parents, 5,000, in all cases, you can have one house and one car, which are not countable assets. So in the example that you have a minor child under age 18, you can have one car and one house. So if you have two cars, then you're already out. If you have, you know, more than the, the asset limit, then you're out. You, you, you're not going to qualify. It is important to make sure that we don't have money um, outside of an ABLE account or a special needs trust in your child's name more than $2,000. They cannot have more than $2,000 in their name. One thing that I want to remind people of, because this is a sneaky thing that comes up, sometimes grandma and grandpa like to buy savings bonds for kids, and it might have been a, a fad 20 years ago or 15 years ago, and you, you forgot about them. Um, those count. So those can be moved to an ABLE account. If they're less than $2,000, it doesn't matter. But just don't forget about those because they'll come up when they, um, they start doing their, their search. And so one of the things that I like to mention here is that what if your child does have more than $2,000 in their name? What can you do about it? Um, so I always like to mention there's no such thing as hiding the money or I'm just going to close the account. They're hip to that kind of stuff. Um, you, you can't do that. Um, but there are legitimate ways that you can go about moving that money. If your child has more than $2,000 in their name, um, that money could be moved to an ABLE account. If it is their money, it could be moved to a first-party special needs trust. It can also be spent down for their benefit. And if you're spending it down for their benefit, um, just keep the receipts. And it could be for any benefit for them. Um, maybe you have a transition program that you're paying for. Maybe you have various therapies that you're paying for. Um, maybe you're paying for an attendant. Um, so, so proof of spending it down is also a legitimate way um, to get those assets in the right bucket. And that is something that, um, that, that we do at Consolidated Planning. We help families with that as well. 
Okay. So when it comes to qualifying for SSI, um, you know, it's a process. The very first thing I'm going to say is it is a process. It is a long, arduous process. So you have to put your patient's hat when you start this train, okay? The first thing I want to tell you about is the Social Security Blue Book. This is basically a medical impairment guide that has all of the guidelines um, for an individual with a disability. They have impairments listed by name by category. And so you can go to this website and you can look up the Social Security Blue Book. They have a child listing and they have an adult listing. If you if your child is under age 18, obviously look in the child listings. If they are over 18, then you want to look in the adult listings. Look up everything they have. Don't assume that one diagnosis is going to get it and the other one isn't. For instance, if they have autism and they also have anxiety or depression or ADHD or insomnia. Look them all up. It tells us exactly what you need to prove to prove that the individual has a disability that would be warranted to be approved for SSI. Do we have an additional question? I have a question. What, what is an ABLE account? We are, um, we're going to move to an ABLE account in just a few minutes, so I'm going to table that one just for now. So the, um, so the Blue Book, as you're preparing, I think it's just a good idea. It tells you exactly what do you have to prove. What do you have to prove? And then what I did is I went to my primary care physician for the kids and said, hey, this is what we have to prove. I'm getting ready to apply for SSI. They're going to request your medical records. I'd like to see what you were, are going to send them because I want to see if the record um, basically shows what we, what we have to prove. And when I looked at our records, it wasn't right. There were mistakes in it, and it wasn't clear. It was vague, and, I, and it wasn't that it was um, – it, it just needed to be updated, and the doctor – you know, had no problem doing that. So you can save yourself some time by doing this step and, and maybe get approved the first time. Okay, <clears throat> what should you apply for and when? Apply for SSI the month of your child's 18th birthday. Appointments should be scheduled a few months in advance for after they turn 18. You can apply through your local office by phone or online. Um, I believe it was like March of last year, they launched the online tool where you can apply for SSI online directly. It literally takes five minutes and you just state your intention to apply and then it basically lets you know that somebody from the Social Security Administration will be calling you in a few weeks to schedule your appointment for the application. Okay, so they're not calling to do the application, they're calling to schedule your appointment for the, for the application. What I like about the online um, tool is that it saves the date. So it goes back to the date of the application, okay? Um, and, they, and they usually call. I know, Veronica, you just went through this process. Once you stated your, um, your notice that you were applying, how long did it take them to call you? I, uh, they respond by via email right away uh, the next day. But um, but st I'm still in the process to waiting for the decision if he's going to be eligible. That I think he is. Um, but we are just still waiting. I still haven't talked to them personally. We don't have those. <clears throat> so the, I did my application the... online, everything online, and submit it. And they say we we got it and your date. Uh, for because it's going to take time for they to say yes, and they are going to they took the day that I submitted or everything online. That's the date, uh, the starting date of to receive the benefit. Sure. I think it'll go back retroactive, and I don't want to discourage anybody um, because the process the the process is frustrating. Um, if your child doesn't have a presumptive condition, there are presumptive conditions, and I'm going to talk about those in a moment. Um, but so <clears throat> you can understand the frustrating process. I applied for my youngest in February of 2022 when she turned 18. She was denied in June. It was appealed in June, and then it went back to disability determination. And from June until March of 2023, 
it was sitting there doing nothing, waiting to be assigned because they were um, behind and understaffed. So it got assigned again in March of 23, denied again in July of 23, and now we have a hearing set for February of um, 2024 will be exactly two years from the date that this started. So I, the reason I'm telling you that is not to discourage you, but to let you know that <clears throat> the process isn't perfect. It is painful. And, and, and it, can, it can them, take a long time. To, it could take one, 120 days. So it's what, uh, six months. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that that I think that that is real realistic, and so so don't plan your finances that I applied for SSI and next month I'm going to get it because that is not happening. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the main message that I want to give you. Um, <clears throat> you want to have evidence that that demonstrates that the child's disability began before age 22 to qualify for childhood disability benefits. It's also called CDB, and it's formally called Disabled Adult Child on a Parent's Record, or DAC is the acronym that they use very frequently. Um, and again, I suggest gathering medical history. So being prepared for your application is important. Names, address, and phone numbers of all the doctors, PCP, psychologists, psychiatrists, they don't care about licensed clinical social workers or counselors, it has to be a, a DO or an MD. Um, diagnosis history, what were they diagnosed with and when? Medication, they want to know what the name of the medication is and what they take the medication for. They don't care about the milligrams. Employer, if any, name, address, and phone number. Last three months of um, bank statements, and you're going to want to have pay subs as well. And, of course, I mentioned uh, consider chatting with the PCP. If your child's condition, if they mostly see a neurologist or if they mostly see a cardiologist, whoever they mostly see. I mean, I know for, for, for my kids, you know, we mostly see specialists. So it's like the bulk of the records identifying all of the disabling conditions are probably not at the PCP. They're probably at some of these specialists. So make sure you have those. <clears throat> what I did is I just created a folder right on my desk desktop um, and I, I created Word documents, listing of the doctors, listing of the meds, listing um, of the, at putting the bank statements in there. So that way you're prepared. A lot of people feel nervous with this application when they're calling them. They feel like they're going to say the wrong thing and mess everything up. You're going to do fine, but just be, pre just be prepared. Have that stuff together. Uh, don't be trying to kind of you know, go through all of your documents while you're on the phone with them. It doesn't, it doesn't go well. Um, so what you should expect after you apply. <clears throat> a decision usually takes up to six months, and I would suggest lately much longer. Some states do much better. Some states aren't as behind as we are. We're behind. Um, after your local office has finalized your application, it is sent to DDS, which is also called Disability Determination Services. In Texas, this is in Austin. Other states have a disability determination uh, <clears throat> uh, unit as well, and they're usually in the capital. Uh, they, re they are going to request and review your loved one's medical records looking for evidence of a disability. So here's the key thing, and this is going to be important for you too, Veronica. If you have applied, okay, Keep notes of everything that you're doing. I have a Word document, and it's sadly 26 pages long of all of the communications that I have had with the Social Security Administration for my kids, okay? <clears throat> you want to know when did you call, what number did you call, what was their extension, who did you talk to, what did they say they were going to do, what did you say you were going to do, what did they confirm receipt of, what did they say they needed, um, and you'll be surprised how often you go back to that record. And then just slide that Word document right in that folder you created on your computer. And then each time you talk to them, you just go right back to it. It's so much better than having a notebook because <laughs> um, it, it, it really keeps it all together. But once you have done your application, usually within two or three weeks, your application should be at DDS, Disability Determination Services. So the sad truth in the state of Texas is most of the Social Security offices right now are not answering their phones. It is maddening. It is not just you. It is happening. And um, 
most of their phones are forwarded to the national line <clears throat> where you sit on hold for an hour and then they answer the phone and they promptly tell you that you should call your local office. Well, thank you very much. I did. And that's how I got to you. <laughs> um, so it is frustrating. But here's the cool thing about DDS. DDS answers the phone. It's awesome. Um, it's not usually a really long hold time. They answer the phone. So after you've completed your application, it's been two or three weeks, you should call that phone number right here on the screen, call DDS and say, I'm calling to follow up on my child's application. I want to make sure it was received. They will pull your child up by social security number. They will advise if it has been received. And guess what? Your case gets assigned to a specific person with a specific um, extension that they will share with you. Okay, so you're going to say has my and so what happened for us is <clears throat> from June to March, it was there, they had it, but it was waiting to be assigned because they were understaffed. So I called every two weeks Has it been assigned. If you call this number and they say, oh, well, we don't have a case for little Johnny, then that tells you that your local Social Security office did not send the application. They're sitting on it and nothing is happening. So that is your cue to go down to the local Social Security office, or if you're lucky, get them on the phone and ask them to move forward with the application or what is what is the holdup. And, and you can lose months this way, so it's really important to, to follow up with DDS. The other thing I want to tell you about DDS, they're the ones that are requesting the medical records. Sometimes, many times, doctors get very, very busy, and they get these requests, and sometimes they slip through the cracks and they don't send your child's records. We've seen people's kids get denied because the doctor simply just didn't respond to the request and did not send the medical records. <clears throat> so when they give you, when your case has been assigned and you have a caseworker, you can ask, um, who is my caseworker, get the extension, call, it, call them and say, I just wanted to follow up on little Johnny's application and I wanted to find out, have you received all of the medical records? They will tell you who they have received and what they have not received. And that is your cue to call and light a fire under that doctor's office. So um, <clears throat> you can ask them, when was the request sent? Call the doctor's office. Where can the doctor send the records? Get the fax number. Call the doctor's office and remind them to send those records over so that way. Because if a kid gets denied because the doctor didn't send the records, you basically have to reapply. I mean, it's kind of a pain. So this is going to be very helpful. Do we have a few questions? Yes, we have a question in the chat. What if you have your child's medical files because your pediatrician passed away? Will they take it? The actual, I'm thinking the, the print record, probably she has the record from, from the child. Do they take those documents? I think that if you have records, I have provided a lot of records in the past um, in my hopes to expedite the process. So if you truly have the records, um, I would say, yes, submit what you have. I think that that could be helpful in the process. So a presumptive condition. So um, this is something, they, a presumptive condition, also known as a compassionate allowance. This link here will take you guys to the compassionate allowance list. There's over 200 conditions that are considered um, for a compassionate allowance. And basically, they fast track the application. And they will start paying up to six months prior to even being approved. Um, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome. Autism, if they have the inability to perform activities of daily living, so it's not straight up a presumptive if, if someone has autism, but if they have the inability to perform activities of daily living, those are to name a few. But this link will take you to those presumptive conditions, and you can see if your child has a presumptive condition. And if they do, don't forget to mention that when you're on the line taking the application with the Social Security worker, don't forget to mention that they have a, they, you know, I understand that my child has a presumptive condition that, that there is a compassionate allowance for that. Is that right? Um, you want to mention that so that way it gets marked appropriately when it gets sent to DDS. If there's a likelihood that the case will be approved for DDS, um, approved DDS will make that um, presumptive decision. Let me go back here in just a second. Do we have any additional questions? 
Okay, so here's, you know, some more um, of the presumptive amputation of a leg at the hip, total deafness, no sound perception in either ear, total blindness, bed confinement or immobility, stroke more than three months in the past, uh, and continued marked difficulty in walking or using hand or arms. Um, we talked about cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, and intellectual disability or autism spectrum di um, disorder with a complete inability to independently perform basic self-care activities such as toilet, eating, dressing, and bathing, okay? So those are some examples of those. Um, so a couple of things we, we talked about um, when you work SSI, um, there's a deduction. So it, when, when an individual is working, there's a deduction to SSI, okay, a reduction. Um, <clears throat> So, so basically, when a person is working, <clears throat> this is going to be how um, it affects benefits. So let's say, for instance, that the individual is earning 1,200 gross monthly earned income. So first, there's a general ex exclusion of $20, and then there's another exclusion if the person is earning income of 65. So basically, they're not going to count the first $85. So that 1,200. We subtract the 85, it comes to 1115. We divide by two, and that means that the individual <clears throat> has $557.50 of countable income. Then they would take the, the 914 per month, they would reduce it by the 557.50, and then the following month, the SSI benefit would be 356.50. So that's basically how earnings um, work with SSI. But there is something called a student earned income exclusion. And this is for um, kids that are students. They don't tell you about this, okay? You have, to, you have to know this. You have to ask for this, okay? It doesn't just automatically get applied. I've seen that happen like never. Um, so the student earned income exclusion, if your loved one is under age 22, between the ages of 18 and 22, regularly attending school, they don't count up to 2220 of their earned income per month when they figure the SSI payment. The maximum year yearly exclusion is 8950 So what does regularly attending school mean? It's in college or university for at least eight hours a week. Note, I said eight hours, not 12, so we know a full-time college load is 12 hours. Um, or in grades 7 through 12 for at least 12 hours a week or in a training course to prepare for an employment at least 12 hours a week um, or 15 hours if it includes shop practice um, and, and less time if it's indicated for reasons beyond the student's control. Homeschooling, if instructed at grade 7 to 12 for at least 12 hours a week. This includes um, those, the transition programs and some of the other things. Again, you have to ask for the student earned income exclusion and it'll be applied. It's only from ages 18 to 22, but if you have a child that is working and they're between those ages and you haven't asked for this, you are leaving money on the table because they can, st they can still get their earnings and they can still get their SSI. Um, Veronica, I'm gonna pause for a second. We have some additional questions. Um, no, with just the ABLE account, but I wanted to comment. It was my question like that. Uh, my my son is in um, 18 plus program and through Texas Workforce Commission, he is in a vocational program or they are training him in a work place right now. So he's receiving, he's working like eight hours a week. Uh, so if uh, they ask, we cannot, we don't need to report that because that's a student earned income exclusion. So it doesn't count. That's a great question. And the answer is yes, you still have to report it, but it won't count. It won't be counted against them. So they won't reduce his SSI, but you are still going to have to report earnings. You always have to report earnings um, and you need to do it monthly. Don't get behind Set a reminder on your calendar. It's due on the 1st. It's late on the 5th. Don't do it three months at a time. Do it once a month. It's due on the 1st, late on the 5th. Report those earnings. Um, if you don't report those earnings and it catches up with you, then you're going to get a letter telling you, you owe us all this money back. So you don't want that. That is a nightmare to unravel. Okay, so it's very, very important. Now, how do you report earnings? You can fax the pay stubs in. 
And you can also on your My Social Security, you have a username and password and upload those pay stubs. But guess what? You have to notify the Social Security Administration of the employer, the name, address, and phone number. And the Social Security Administration has to put them into your child's case. And you won't be able to upload pay stubs into their My Social Security until the local office has updated their employer in the system. So prior to that, you can take them in, you can fax them, you can mail them, which I don't recommend, um, or you can upload them in the portal. That's where you do that, okay? So <clears throat> the Social Security Red Book is also an important book. So we have the Blue Book, which is the Medical Impairment Guide. And then we have the Social Security Blue Book, I mean, the, the, the Red Book. And this is just a reference resource about how working affects benefits. And remember, there's two different programs, SSDI and SSI. Working affects the two different programs differently, so you need to educate yourself on this. So the Social Security Red Book, and again, if your child is in Workforce Commission in vocational rehab, um, those organizations have SNEs subject matter experts um, on, on benefits and maintaining benefits and phases of work. Um, so it's not like if the child goes to work, they're just going to instantly be cut off and it's just over, you're done. Um, there's phases of work because they, they understand that a person with a disability may have the desire to work and they may or may not be able to, but they would like to try their hand at it. And that's why there's phases of work. And the Social Security Red Book is going to explain those phases to work. Another organization that is not in my slides, and this is a Texas organization, is called Imagine Enterprise. Um, they're wonderful. They offer free benefit counseling to individuals that are getting government benefits and wanting to work and it will provide benefit counseling and how how this will affect because a lot of families it's very important that they don't lose Medicare or Medicaid um, you know whatever the program is mostly it's Medicaid that they don't want to lose because they might be getting a Medicaid waiver or something along those lines but Imagine Enterprises does a lot of benefit counseling we do that as, uh, as well but um, the, the tough cases the super tough cases we're going to refer out to Imagine Enterprises they do a great job <clears throat> one thing that you need to know before you apply is if you're in in, in the case of a divorce or child support situation, a lot of times in many states, and Texas is one of them, um, child support may continue past age 18 if the individual has a disability. This is important for you to understand that um, once the child turns 18, that child support is basically going to be counted against them for, as income um, for SSI purposes. And so it's going to be important that you work with an attorney to get the child support redirected. You need a court order redirecting the child support to a first party special needs trust, which means you're going to have to set up a first party special needs trust and you're going to need to work with an attorney to get that redirected to a first party special needs trust. It can go smoothly if both parties agree. I mean, some people do, some people don't. I understand there is a reason for a divorce, but um, you, a lot of times people can agree that if it's in the best interest of the child, who cares if it goes to the, it's the same amount of money, who cares if it goes to the special needs, um, the special needs trust. But so, so people that don't take care of this are shocked when they get denied because the child support was still there. So they get denied for SSI. It's not because the kid wasn't disabled. It's just because they, they counted this against them um, for, for, the income purposes. So this is very, very important. And I would suggest if this is you, that you get this taken care of before the application. The other thing that I have seen over the years that is a nightmare with this is where the Social Security um, Administration approves the SSI and Medicaid, and then five years later comes back and says, oh, snap, you've been getting child support all this time, and we didn't count this against them, and now we have, and now you owe us $50,000, you know, something along those lines. We have a question. Uh, Denise says, I'm confused. Enterprise has a fee-based service? Imagine Enterprises is, 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 is free. It is, it, they are contracted with the Social Security Administration to provide benefit um, counseling. And whether or not they have a fee-based service, I'm not really sure about that, but I know that for, for benefit counseling, it has historically been free. 
And another question, I'm concerned about submitting bank statement to SSI, Social Security. This is a parent's income, not the adult child, correct? Isn't it child? So, so if the child is a minor, it, you have to submit your income and assets if the child is a minor. If the child is an adult, um, you submit their bank statements. Some kids don't have a bank statement. What I recommend is if you're applying for SSI, that you open a bank account specifically for the benefit of said child's SSI. And then you submit those bank statements. Um, they don't require you to have a separate bank account, but I prefer that. And I think it's a smarter way to go about it because they are gonna do an asset check every once in a while. And if you have those funds commingled with yours, if you're the parent, your child is an adult, and you have their SSI funds commingled with theirs, whenever they do the, the check, you're going to have to send your bank statements and all the glory. So don't do that. Um, just have a separate bank account. I think that's the smarter option. Okay. So childhood disability benefits, RSDI, retirement survivor disability benefits. Um, this is what I was telling you earlier, used to be called DAC, D um, Disabled Adult Child. So basically, um, a lot of our kids may not work. And if they don't work, they'll never pay into the Social Security system. So basically, they would never qualify for Social Security in the future, like Social Security retirement. But they have a program, the Childhood Disability Benefits Program, that basically if your child had a disability that started prior to age 22, they can be covered under a parent's record. Um, and, and how this works is basically the parent either has to be disabled or drawing Social Security retirement. Um, but the child is entitled to 50% of the parent's record. So let me give you kind of a little story. Let's say I'm retired. I'm retired, I'm drawing Social Security retirement. My benefit is $4,000 a month. I have a child with a disability whose disability started prior to age 22. My child is eligible for CDB um, under a parent's record. My child would then become eligible for CDB and would start getting $2,000 a month. Now they don't get both usually, it's whatever benefit is higher. So if the benefit under CDB is lower than the SSI amount, they'll get some CDB, they'll get some SSI to be made whole. Um, but if the benefit is more in the example of I get $4,000, my child would get $2,000, they will switch over from SSI to CDB or RSDI or SSDI under a parent's record basically and start getting that $2,000 a month and then after 24 months, they will be eligible for Medicare. So they will maintain their eligibility for Medicaid. A lot of people worry about this transition that when this happens, they're going to make too much money and they're going to lose Medicaid and we can't have that. And there's a rule called 1619B. This is not in my slides. So if you're taking notes, you can write this down. 1619B, that if the individual qualified for Medicaid first, prior to the parent retiring and, and then flipping over to CDB, that even if the amount of what the child's gonna get now is more than what Medicaid allows, that they will continue to get Medicaid. Now, in a perfect world, it just flips over and you keep on getting Medicaid, but it's not a perfect world. And sometimes you have to reapply and you have to tell Health and Human Services, I get to keep Medicaid under 1619B and you have to reapply and people lose their minds and they're worried about losing the waiver and it's pretty stressful. But just know that you absolutely do get to keep it. Um, just know, don't be worried about turning on your social security and worrying about that the, your child is going to lose Medicaid. But just in case we have anybody that's thinking about turning on their social security right now and your child isn't 18, I would urge you to pause. Um, I would urge you to apply for the child's SSI first once they turn 18, let them get approved, let them get approved for Medicaid first, then turn on your benefits because 1619B uh, doesn't apply if you messed up when you should have applied.
Okay. So if you, so, so my example, if I had a 17 and a half year old and I turned on my social security benefits and my benefits are $4,000 a month, my child became eligible for CDB prior to SSI and Medicaid. So 1619B is not going to apply and she's not getting Medicaid. Okay, so that's really, really important. Guys, we are nationally certified as Social Security Advisors. We have a specialized software that does a complete analysis that takes every earning year you've had, you and your spouse, it plugs it in and it tells us exactly when and how you should pull the trigger on your Social Security benefits to maximize benefits for the whole household. It takes into consideration a benefit called child and care and it tells us dollars and cents down to the month of when you should apply. And when you call the Social Security Administration um, and you tell them, I want to turn on my benefits, they're not going to say, well, you know, you're making a mistake. <laughs> you know, uh, so you want to be careful and you want to choose wisely and make sure that you're doing it in the right order and we can definitely help with that. Um, so again, to, um, for CDB, if your child, this is a very, very, very important factor. It's not just if their disability started prior to age 22. If as long as they, their disability started prior to age 22 and they have not performed substantial gainful activity, if your child has worked and earned more than the substantial gainful amount per month, they no longer qualify for CDB. So I'm a fan of kids working. If they can work, let's, you know, have them working. They want to work. But if you think that their work will never, um, you know, amount to substantial, a substantial amount, then you want to make sure that their their work is under the substantial gainful activity because they will lose the CDB benefits. Another thing, it's real important to understand, um, plenty of people have disabilities and they still get married. If, um, if a person is getting SSI and they get married, they're going to probably lose it because it will be based off of their spouse's income and assets, so they'll probably lose it. And you for sure lose the ability to be covered under a parent's record if the individual gets married. So, so if they're qualifying for CDB, clearly they have a disability. It started prior to age 22. They're qualified under a parent's record. The minute they get married, it's over, and you can't get it back. Okay? So I just want you guys to know that. Okay. Do we have some additional questions? Yes. If CDV applies, is the recipient's retirement benefit reduced? If CDB applies, it's the higher of the two. So if the benefit on SSI is 914 a month, and if you turn on the, the your Social Security benefits or you become disabled and your child is eligible for CDB, um, and the CDB benefit is higher than the SSI, then they're going to get the higher amount. It's not double. And it's one or the other of the parents. So, like, maybe one parent retires first. So they could be under CDB if parent one. And then the second parent retires, but the second parent's benefits are higher than the first benefits. We can switch the kid to the other parent. But it's, So it's one or the other. You can switch, but it's not both. Okay, so I think we talked um, a lot about this. I, the only thing I wanted to hit on, on, on this slide is when it comes to um, the, the, the CDB benefits, it's 50% of the parent's record up to um, uh, up till the parent dies. When the parent dies, that benefit is increased to 75% of the, uh, the deceased parent's Social Security, and that will remain in place for the rest of the child's life as long as they remain disabled. Okay. The only other thing I want to mention here is you got to be aware of family maximums in families where a spouse is drawing off of the other spouse's record or a family where maybe there might be more than one child that has a disability that started prior to age 22. So more than one child drawing off of a parent's record, there are such things as family maximums. And you can read about that on the social security website. It's clear as mud. It's very confusing, but it's basically like 188% of the workers benefit. Um, and, and I would argue that I've seen it be between 150 and 188 percent. So um, to be entitled and to Social Security file an application, you got to be found to be medically disabled, fully insured, is not working or working, but the countable earned income is less than the substantial gainful activity per month. So 
a couple of things that we want you to be um, sure of is uh, pr protecting your child's benefit. You want to make sure that you have your child's assets in the right buckets. Um, and this is the special needs trust and the ABLE account. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. We're um, running out of time, but we're going to hit that. Um, we want to ensure that special needs family member is not named or set up as a beneficiary on any life insurance, investment, or bank account. A lot of families name spouses as their beneficiary, and if I'm dead and gone, then that's easy. My kids split the money. Well, if you name your child outright and you die, the child's going to get the money. They're going to have more than $2,000 in their name, and they're going to disqualify from SSI and Medicaid. So the way we fix this is we leave money to a third-party special needs trust for the benefit of said child. We don't name the child outright on anything. And it's really important to have intentional conversations um, with any aging family members on this, grandma and grandpa, any affluent family members that love your child that might leave them money. Um, as I mentioned, fewer than one-tenth of one percent of all financial advisors are nuanced and special needs. So when grandma and grandpa goes to their financial advisor and says, hey, I love my grandson, he has special needs, and I'd like to leave some money to him. They say, great, what's his name? And they put that child's name down on the beneficiary. So that's why it's so, so important that you have these intentional conversations. Your family doesn't want to mess your child up. It is important that it goes to a third-party special needs trust for the child. So um, kind of getting into the meat of um, ABLE accounts, um, ABLE accounts is for uh, an individual whose disability started prior to age 26. It's under the tax code 529A. Um, and this is going up to age 46 in 2026, just so you know, if the disability started prior to age 46. Um, contributions can be made by anyone. It's limited to the gift tax exclusion, which changes every year. It's 17000 for 2023. Um, and if the individual is working, they can contribute up to an additional $13,590. Um, basically, the money grows tax-free. It's tax-free distributions. And if it can be construed as achieving a better life uh, for an individual with a disability, you can pay for it on an ABLE account. We have entire presentations on the ABLE account. We help, help people um, set ABLE accounts up all day long. And especially if a kid is getting... Um, childhood disability benefits and they're getting a higher amount, you're going to want that ABLE account because you can move money from the account where the SSI was deposited to an ABLE account or to a first party special needs trust. Um, one, a couple of things I want to mention here, you cannot have earnings direct deposited to an ABLE account. That's not a thing. You can't do it. There's no such thing as hiding earnings in an ABLE account. The person can get paid, and then you can move earnings to an ABLE account, and that's completely legitimate. And if, uh, another thing that you need to know about an ABLE account is you can't leave an ABLE account as a beneficiary. So while we can leave a, uh, a special needs trust a beneficiary, we cannot leave an ABLE account as a beneficiary, and that is why sometimes uh, you need the ABLE account and um, a special needs trust, okay? So um, the cool thing about an ABLE account that is different than a special needs trust is that you can pay for food and shelter out of an ABLE account without a one-third reduction to SSI. You can pay for food and shelter out of a special needs trust, but there would be a one-third reduction to SSI. So it's important to understand how all of that works. You can pay for food and shelter out of the account where the SSI gets deposited to. You can pay for it out of an ABLE account. But if you pay for it out of a special needs trust, it would reduce SSI by one-third. Okay? So um, these are just some items that a special needs trust can pay for. The list is endless. It's a long, long list. Again, if it could be construed as achieving a better life for an individual with a disability, you can pay for it. But paying rent and debt service for food and shelter out of a trust would cause that one-third reduction. Okay? Um, so this just kind of reiterates that a little bit. So special needs planning. Thinking about who's going to care for your child when we're, go when we're gone, um, we help families de develop a future care plan that will answer some of these questions. If you're in a kind of a transition mode, it's time to, you know, really consider post-high school education options, vocational options. Veronica mentioned VR. 
vocational rehab. And just so you guys know, this is through the Texas Workforce Commission here in Texas. If you're joining us from out of state, vocational rehab is in every state. Okay, so you have a VR counselor. Many people have counselors, VR counselors in their public high school or private school. Um, but you do have vocational rehab in your state as well. We suggest considering touring transition programs, partial care, full care, um, you know, some of these waiting lists can be long, and it's not how can we institutionalize our loved one, but who's going to care for your child when you're gone? And we suggest making careful considerations before you saddle up another sibling with that responsibility because it's not necessarily fair, and it's not necessarily probably what either one of them would want. We like to see a sibling to be a trustee of a trust and to be able to fund the care um, and where the, your loved one is at a place that they love, they have some autonomy, they have friends, they have purpose, um, and they can have a relationship, um, a, a, a great relationship between the two of them and not an obligatory relationship. So these are just some things to keep on your radar, how to develop a comprehensive special needs care plan. We do things like future care cost estimates. How much money do I need to fund the special needs trust? Am I going to run out of money? Do I have enough money to retire and stay retired and still fund the special needs trust? Um, we have um, webinars on Texas waivers and interest lists, how to get on those interest lists. We've talked about ABLE accounts today entire presentations on ABLE accounts. We have entire presentations on special needs trust, the different types of special needs trust. There's a first party, which is the kids' money. There's a third party, and this is how we leave money to our kids. Um, and guardianship, that's another topic that comes up, and we have entire webinars on that, on how the process works. Um, guardianship, alternatives to guardianship. In, in Texas, we have something called the Supported Decision-Making Agreement. Some other states have that, but not all of them. Um, but there are, um, there are many options and alternatives to guardianship, so um, you guys can check that out as well. And just know, post-high school options, there's a ton of educational options out there for our kids. There are a ton of educational options at higher education institutions specifically for kids that have an intellectual disability. Um, and we have complete webinars on college planning for special needs on the Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel. So today, everybody's going to get a copy of today's slides. Um, this link here is going to be our upcoming webinars, um, which you can register for. You, they'll have the topics, and, and you can kind of see which ones might make the most sense for you. We work on a collaborative team here at Consolidated Planning Group, um, members of the Special Needs Planning Academy, nationally certified as Social Security Advisors, top of the table with MDRT. Um, and, we, and we want to help you. We know that there's a lot of questions. We know that there's a lot of confusion. We know that people feel pretty overwhelmed with all of this stuff. Um, but we definitely want to help you in the journey. And we want to encourage you not to be discouraged um, as you're going through this. It is definitely a lot. Um, and if you have been feeling overwhelmed by that, you're definitely not alone. So just know strength in knowing that you're definitely not alone and you're not crazy. This is unnecessarily difficult. Um, we always offer free personalized consultation. And when you guys get the slides, uh, you can hover over this QR code. It'll take you to a calendar where you can schedule, um, you can schedule yourself for a free consultation. Um, we've gone a little bit over. Um, just do you want to take one or two more questions? Yes, let's, let's do one or two more questions before we uh, wrap up. Uh, in the chat, Joanna says, I used to get SSI for my grandchild until his father passed away. Then he started receiving his father's death benefits. Since the death benefits are under 914, can he receive the difference? He should be able to receive the difference. If, if, the, if the survivor benefits are less than the 914, depends on the age of the grandson. Now, one thing I would have to say is if the grandson is under age 18 it's, it's, and he's living with you, it would be based off of your assets and income. So basically, if you have more than $2,000 in your name, more than one house, more than one car, he probably won't qualify for SSI. But later when he turns 18, if he's under 18, later when he turns 18, he should. All right. Uh, in the Q&A, um, my child is receiving a monthly stipend as part of my spouse's SSDI. But my eight 
year child has been diagnosed with intellectual disability. So my child can apply for her CDV now or will need to wait until eight, she, she's 18 years old. If a parent is disabled and they have minor children, if a parent retires or if they become disabled through the Social Security Administration and they have minor children, the minor children, regardless of the disability, qualify for benefits. So if a parent has died or if a parent is disabled or drawing benefits, the minor children qualify um, under, under the parent's records. So you would need to apply for that. You can't apply for that online. You do need to go into the office for that meeting. Got it. The last one, oh, I don't think I understand it, but maybe you can. Uh, can qualify my son if he's a permanent, permanent resident? He's 19 years old. I don't know. Is that my migration question? Yeah, I believe that you can if he is a permanent resident. If he's a if he's a U.S. permanent resident, I believe that you can. If they're not, then they absolutely won't. Um, they absolutely won't qualify. And I'm sure that there's a lot of other questions that we didn't get to today and we're out of time. Reach out to us, guys. We're happy to help any way that we can. Um, and uh, let's not forget Veronica's survey. Um, I'm going to stop my share, of Veronica, so you can put your survey up there. I know that's important for the grant at, at Partners yes. Resource Network. You are, you are going to receive the uh, an email after we end this presentation. It's automatically, and it's just three questions uh, for an evaluation of the presentation of today. Please help us with that. And later today, you are going to receive an email with the presentation slides and a YouTube link with the video also of this presentation and uh please don't hesitate to contact us uh allison or me if you have more questions thank you so much guys and see you guys thanks guys have a have a great afternoon bye now bye